Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. This is the Little Bean and Me podcast channel. My name's Kayleen and I'm your host and today I am getting to record a podcast. Hooray! I'm so excited. Um, if it's your first time here, welcome. This is a channel, <laughs> sorry if you can hear my son laughing in the background. It's a channel that's full of interruptions, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, this is a podcast about uh, crocheting and knitting, spinning, mostly hand dyeing yarn, and pretty much anything crafty that I'm getting up to, I like to update you guys on in this little podcast. Um, so it's been probably a month or so since I filmed my last podcast, and so I have a few things that I'm ready to share with you guys. One thing, including here, is the new background for my podcast. So yay for reorganizing. If you've been following me on Instagram, uh, and if you aren't, you should. Uh, I'll leave my information here at the bottom of the screen. I'm at Little Bean Crochet on Instagram. I have been talking about and reorganizing my office. So this room that I'm in right now, I'm sitting underneath a loft bed at the moment, but it used to have a twin bed on the floor. There's also an elliptical machine, and then all of my business is in this room which is a lot of yarn <laughs> and a lot of clutter. Uh, and in the last year, it's gotten crazy out of control. So um, last year, I redesigned this room to better suit the needs of podcast filming and my business and kind of everything that goes along with that. And as things have grown and as things have changed in our family, um, this room has kind of changed purpose. In the last few weeks, if you've been following me on Instagram, you've been following along the journey, but I have been kind of deconstructing this room a little bit, rearranging, reassembling furniture to better suit our needs, and also just trying to make it work better for the space that we have. So as a result, I have a lovely little filming space, which is right underneath our uh, new loft bed, and I hung up some fairy lights, so that would be really cute uh, for you guys to see and look at and of course I moved a little no face over here above my shoulder um, so yeah welcome back to my podcast uh, I hope you guys are all doing well I hope you guys are enjoying the start of summertime uh, even though it doesn't quite feel like summer well some days it does and some days it doesn't and today it's pretty humid but cool and I don't know what the weather is doing these days but it's been pretty crazy so I'm going to start off with a little bit of personal update and then I'll put a timestamp here on the screen if you wanted to skip forward to more crafty and works in progress things so I'll put the timestamp right here for you uh, but anyway since last time we have updated and for those who may be new here um, I'm a stay-at-home mom and I have two kids uh, one my daughter the oldest is almost five and my son is almost three and I've been at home since my daughter was well I was home when she was born went to work for three months and then I started to stay at home. She was around six months old. So I've been at home with my kids for almost five years. And it's been a very long five years, uh, very rewarding and wonderful, but also very hard and stressful. And so in that token, uh, some things are going to be changing in our family. No, I am not pregnant. No, we are not having any more kids. But um, my daughter is in school part-time. She's in preschool right now. She'll have one more year of preschool. Uh, because in Massachusetts, she misses the cutoff date for starting kindergarten. She Her birthday is right after the cutoff, so, oh well, <laughs> that's okay. Um, so she'll spend another year in her nursery program, which she absolutely loves. And then my son, who I was anticipating for him to enter the same nursery program, because siblings not they don't automatically get in, but when they're ready, they're able to go into the school. Um... He's not, well, he might not be attending that preschool program in the fall, and I was really banking on him having a couple of days where he's at school or some kind of day day um, program where I'm not present and he can learn and do things on his own because, frankly, he's never been away from me, and both he and I could probably use that break. Um, and for those of you who don't know, my son has really severe food allergies uh, that we've been dealing with since he was around two months old and environmental allergies as well, but his food allergies are really our main stumbling block. So finding any kind of outside care is near impossible. I don't trust anyone. Um, it's been a very large source of stress and depression and anxiety and all of these things for me, especially in the last uh, year and a half where he's had a lot of changes and new allergies have been added and his symptoms finally are starting to level out and we're actually have a really good handle right now on what is going on in his little body. So 
we finally, finally found a program that is able to take him on despite his allergies, a small at-home daycare program starting probably in the next three weeks. He'll be going there two days a week for full days, just like Cecilia goes to her school for full days. He'll be going at the same time, but to this other program, at least starting for the summer. And so that will mean I will have two full days without any children for the first time in five years. I will be alone in my house able to do whatever I need to do without anyone here, which to some of you guys, if you don't have kids, you might not be able to relate to that. But if you do have children, uh, and especially small children, maybe you can relate to me on that front where your time is no longer your own and it's a sacrifice that I made in becoming a parent. Um, but it's also something, I, I've had ambitions that have not been able to be fulfilled or realized or worked on because I have two small kids at home. And when he was first born, I started this podcast and it was easier for me to get a, more time to myself because he slept so often and all of those things. But now that he's older and Cece is older, it just means that there's a lot more going on all the time. And I know that won't change very much. It will just change context where I'll be taxiing them to their sporting events or social events. But in terms of being at home 24-7 with the children, it will finally, finally be a little bit of a break. So I am very thankful. I cried a lot about it because he is allergic to soy and egg and milk and sunflower. He is also allergic to peanuts. He also doesn't eat tree nuts because we're not sure if he's allergic and there's a lot of cross-contamination with peanuts. He, he also doesn't eat fresh berries uh, because we're not entirely clear whether he is allergic to fresh berries. So he has five of the top eight allergens that are severe. He carries an EpiPen, he takes allergy medication, and so now I have found somewhere that he can be somebody who's willing to take him on, who is willing to care for him in the way that I would care for him. Obviously, mom is best because, you know, mom is best, but um, somebody that I can trust. And so the way we found her was through a local connection. So if any of you guys are allergy parents or you have kids who have special needs, definitely put your feelers out into the community because you may find a resource that you you didn't even know was there to begin with. And that was really was what happened with us. Um, one of my daughter's classmates, her parents, contacted me and said, hey, we send my food allergy child to this person for daycare and we really trust her. And so <laughs> from, you know, in a parent's sense, and especially a kid with food allergies or someone who has special needs, you know, that really means a lot that they trust this person with their child. Um, so... I just, I don't even know how to describe how I feel. I feel a little sad because I won't be with Tucker all the time. I also feel really happy because I won't be with Tucker all the time and I'll be able to do a bunch more um, things in terms of working and doing my business and things that I really love to do that is outside of being, you know, a mom all the time, 24 hours a day at call for every single small thing. So it'll be a change and it will still be, hard and stressful and you know busy but it will be busy in a different way and so I'm really looking forward to that change. If any of you guys are parents or if you have small kids or your kids are just a little bit older you know definitely leave me some comments uh, below. I would really love to hear your turning points um, if you've been a stay-at-home parent you know with your children or how things change for you over time because I have a lot of friends who are at-home parents or they're working part-time or they're working full time. So there's not many people that I'm friends with that is in my exact position where I'm home 24 hours a day. So if you have any suggestions, comments, questions, please do leave them in the comments below. Now we will get onto the crafty things. In the, so in the last few weeks, I've been doing a bit of dyeing. I share a lot on Instagram. Again, <laughs> that's where it's easiest for me to share, really. Um, and so I've been working on some projects and working on dyeing yarn. And so I'll show you the works I have that are in progress, starting with the smallest piece, which is right here. Um, this I decided to cast on because I had dyed up a ton of bright colors, which I'll share with you in a moment. But um, 
I wanted to have a little bit of a palette cleanser. My big project is behind me. It's the Changes Shawl. It's a foreskin shawl and it's a full foreskin, so it's a long project, but very enjoyable, and I'll talk about it in a moment. But I decided to cast on Chevron Shenanigans. So this is a Stephen West pattern, and it is kind of a semicircular um, asymmetrical shawl that has some chevron patterning on one side and so I decided to cast it on in a fade where I would take some of the brights and kind of go in a rainbow order. So right now I have two of my yarns. I have Bright Bow and I have fizz, Fizzing Whiz Bangs which I'll sh also show you in a moment and of course I'm in the middle of a row so here we go. So I have just started on Wedge 6 which is the large in the large shawl, it is where you start alternating colors to do your first fading change. And so here's the chevron patterning, and here's where I've just started feathering in the um, secondary color. So the primary color is Bright Bow, which you can see is a very bright rainbow type color, um, and it has uh, fluorescent pinks and yellows, blues, greens, that whole the whole nine. And then Fizzing Whiz Bangs is much more of just the orange and pinks. So as you can see here, it is bright. It is this bright, really, um, but it's fluorescent pinks and there's some orange and yellow in here. So very bright, very fun. I'm looking forward to feathering this color in and <clears throat> eventually just having that be my color that I'm working with. Um, I'm working with my singles base, which is Simple Sock. And it's been really lovely to work with. I've never, I've crocheted with this before, but I've never knit with it. And I am very much enjoying knitting with it. It's definitely thicker than my sock yarn, so it seems like things are moving along a little bit more quickly. But again, I'm also at the beginning, and it's also a new pattern to me. So even though I've done a Stephen West pattern before, um, this is just, you know, me learning the patterns and the short rows and how things are going to be working pretty much for the majority of the shawl. So that is in this bag. This was in my watermelon bag. So I did a collaboration with Sunshine and Bubblegum, Lynn, her podcast, and I dyed up some watermelon sock yarn, but this was one of the bags that I purchased from her for my own personal use. So this is from her. If you've never checked her podcast out, you should. Here's her little, little taggy waggy, Sunshine and Bubblegum. So this I have two skeins and the project and I will outgrow this bag but for now this is where I will live. And the piece de la resistance is the changes shawl. So I dyed up several kits for the changes shawl and I'm going to be dyeing more probably um, since everybody was very much into it. I have kicked up the second half of my rainbow. So for those who were following along the first time I was into the um, the first section where you're building out from your center square. I think that's section B. And I'm only on the first side and I'm going to try my best to show you. Of course I'm in the middle of a row. <laughs> Aren't I always in the middle of a row? I was knitting on this at the playground this morning without dropping. So I have half the stitches on hold on a set of circulars. Two sets of circulars in here. Okay, here we go. So here is the changes shawl. As you can see, it is quite large. I am doing my best. <laughs> um, okay, so here is the shawl itself. So this is the top edge of the shawl and the center square, and it goes all the way out in rainbow gradient fashion. So here's a good look at the gradient. Uh, this goes in a triangular shape. So I've already I've already gone a bit past this point. I've started the next section, but this is the general shape that comes out from this side. And I have started section C, which is kind of a cluster stitch section. So you can see there's parts where it's it's mostly stockinette and there are parts where you are clustering uh, three stitches together. In the pattern, if you're working with mini skeins, you would be you know, switching your mini skein color every two or three sections, I think, every two or three 
like, so you have like your clusters and then some plain rows and clusters and plain rows. And so when you repeat it so many times, you end up changing it. But because I'm using a continuous gradient, um, I'm not worried about changing it. I'm just going to continue knitting once I run out of this green or once I finish this pair, I'm going to change balls because I am quite literally down to the nubbins here. I have only this much left for my first gradient. So, um, so yeah, there's not much here. I mean, this is all that's left from that first gradient. So once I go back for the rest of this, this is around like 80 stitches or so, I will change off to my next gradient. But this came out so beautifully. I... I am really, really, really loving this shawl, and it's going to be huge, and it's going to be fun to wear, and it's going to be fun to display, and it's, I'm just, I, I can't wait, I cannot wait to be done with this. Um, the clusters move a little slowly for me, again, because I'm learning the new texture, I'm only one or two repeats into the section, so I'm just kind of getting the hang of doing the cluster stitches, I've never done knit cluster stitches before, so this is a first for me, um, but I'm finding it I think easier than what it would be if I were knitting English style. Um, the way I knit is continental, so I hold my yarn in my left hand, and I also do Norwegian purling, so I'm never moving my yarn to the front. I'm always inserting my needle behind my yarn. And so because of that, doing the cluster stitches are really easy, and I'm able actually, when I'm inserting my needle to start doing some clustering, um, I'm able to sweep my yarn farther over so I have more slack um, in, in my actual stitch because cluster stitches tend to pull in a lot and it could feel a little tight and in her pattern she says to go up a needle size. I haven't gone up a needle size. I generally am a very loose knitter and, and especially since this is a finer yarn um, in terms of like yardage per gram. But anyway, so I haven't gone up a needle size, but I don't foresee that being an issue for me just because of my tension. So here are the little cluster bits, which is really, really cute and fun. But you can see, if it won't focus on my face, that I have a lot of give there in terms of blocking. So when I am blocking this out later, which I don't even know if I will, um, I, I, I'm not too cinched in here where where I feel like if I were throwing the yarn or if I were doing a traditional continental purl that I might have the tendency to really hook the, the yarn and pull it tight. So I'm not having that problem so far. Let's not drop any stitches. Let's not do that. And put this on the desk because it's not going to fit back in the bag. I've also outgrown this bag. I have to figure out a different way to um, get my yarn. I have to figure out a different way to hold those stitches because I can't have them loose on that knitting needle because I'm constantly afraid that the needles are just going to come out. So I have to get like caps for my needles or something. I don't know. I have to figure it out. Let me show you what I've been dyeing. I have um, some new colorways and some old colorways that I've dyed up over the last few weeks. And I have everything that I'm about to show you in that little pile um, is in stock on Everyday Sock and it's also in stock on Simple Sock. And so I'm just going to show you the Simple Sock because that's what I grabbed off my rack and that will be that. So let me grab it. All right. So first we'll start with the brights and a couple of these colors you've just seen. Uh, this is Bright Bow which is a bright rainbow speckled color. And this is on Simple Sock, what I'm showing you, but again, it's available both on Simple Sock and every day. So that's Bright Bow. Here's Wildfire Whiz Bangs, which is fluorescent pinks, orange, and yellow. The orange and yellow, I don't believe are fluorescent, but the pink is. So there's Bright Bow. And then we have Mimble Wimble, which is not a new colorway but one that I, I slightly changed how I dye it, but generally it's the same um, colors. It's a few shades of blue and two shades of yellow in speckled form, of course. This one is a new color. This is called Reducto. This is um, a destructive spell and it gives off a green light. And so I thought it would be cool to call this Reducto. But it's um, a very summery green-blue color. 
uh, my friend Christine, actually, who consequently will be moving underneath our little apartment. She was over and I was dying and she's like, can I pick colors to dye? And so she's actually the one who created this. So thanks, Christine. Um, beautiful chartreuse and aquas and just oceany blue and it's just beautiful. I just love this color. I really need to invest in a skein twister because I'm breaking my my body twisting all these skeins okay here we go so there is reducto again on an ecru base but colored very brightly and very speckly and then this one is called spectra specs so spectra specs is not a new colorway for me i dyed spectra specs on a sock blank once but it was mostly this pink color with this blue speckled on it uh and it wasn't it was more of like a solid pink with the blue speckles, but I wanted to speckle both. And so I decided to create this colorway, um, like recreate this colorway in a different way that would better suit my dyeing style, what I prefer to dye. So this is Spectre Specs. It is a, a blue, kind of an indigo color, and a bright fluorescent pink, purple, purpley pink, which is very reminiscent of Luna's Spectre Specs. Okay, so those are the brights, and those are the five bright colors that I will be using in my Chevron Shenanigans shawl. Very bright, very loud, very much out of my comfort zone. Normally I'm dying more earthy colors, and so if you're into brights, definitely go check out the shop. They're there, they're available. I still have to label them all, but um, they're all kind of just hanging on my shelf right now. And so let me grab the other set, which are more earthy tones and more familiar colorways. So first, we will start with one of my most dear, near and dear colorways, which is Luna. So Luna is a pale yellow with a blue-violet color and pops of this beautiful, cool toned pink. Very delicate, very lovely, very quirky, very Luna. Um, the next one is lavender. So I, in my last dye up, I had dyed Ron, and so I decided to dye some Lav Lav to go with Wan Wan. Although I think all my Wan Wan is gone at this point. So it has some mauve and navy tones, and also a warm yellow. And she goes very well with Wan Wan. I used both of them in my exploration station shawl, and it was very nice. Uh, an oldie but a goodie, one of the most favorited colors that I've ever dyed, which is prongs. So this is a sage green with a brown that breaks red and kind of a wheat yellow. It's kind of a straw colored yellow. So like a green, green yellow. One of the most favorited colors of all time. Then we have Mimbulus Nibbletonia. So if you saw my last video, and if you haven't, you should definitely um, check out the video up there. But this is a green, sage green, with pops of deep teal and purple and sage. So, and it is, it was a password for, I think it was in Prisoner of Azkaban, Goblet of Fire. I forget which one. It was used as a password from the fat lady, uh, but it's actually a plant. So Mimbulus Mimbletonia is actually a cactus plant. And if you've seen the movies, you've seen uh, Ron carrying the Mimbulus Mimbletonia in his arms. And if I can find a picture, I'll pop it here. But this is um, the color of that. And this color was a happy accident, actually. Uh, it was a colorway that I didn't think would happen, and it did. <laughs> so. Um, there's that and then the last one which is another favorite of mine which is divination and this colorway is a dark gray so there's kind of a neutral gray and a blue tone gray uh, a vibrant blue color and also um, dark purple that kind of breaks blue speckled so this is lovely on a it's a nice speckled on a gray base and um, this was also a colorway that was born out of an oops, an oopsie moment. If you've been following along for a while, I did a custom dye of the Lost Diadem, which uses two of the colors that are in here, and there was 
it was stricken with some pink dye somewhere. I don't know how it got on there. And then I decided to over dye it and divination was born. So that's this colorway. And then the final colorway, which I don't do many tonals, like true tonals. Uh, I have I have a dye to order listing in my Etsy shop for tonal yarn. It is basically out of the pot tonals that are you know just a single color. So I have all my Dharma dyes listed. I can dye any of them on any base, and I can dye them to complement my um, my main colorways. But I had a request from uh, Anna over at Silent Knits. She is a small indie dyer, but she's also a knitwear designer. And so she's been really working on her knitwear design and she's been working on collaborative projects with other indie dyers to kind of showcase colorways and showcase her work. And so everything she does is based on music and you know she has this whole story. So if you've never heard of her or seen her, you can find her on Ravelry, I think, as Silent Knits. And um, she has a whole whole bunch of patterns. They're pretty simple, pretty, pretty straightforward. And um, so she wanted to design something with my yarn and she had purchased some yarn. And so she asked me to dye a tonal based on a photograph that she had. And so I said, of course I would. And so this tonal is a deep indigo color and it has bits of green in here as well. And the camera's not gonna do it as much justice as it deserves, but it is a very saturated and deep tonal colorway. And the pieces where the green is, is here, and it's just this deep kind of ocean green. And so she's combining this, I believe, with my Padfoot colorway, and it's supposed to be like waves crashing on the beach. And so this is supposed to be more, mostly like the ocean. And so I called this the Black Lake. And it's a tonal and it's available to shop just on Everyday Sock. I think I only have three skeins left. So if you're interested in this color, definitely go check out the shop. I'll make sure to link up here in the iCards uh, for you guys that might be interested. So that's pretty much that. I do have some spinning, but there's not much on my bobbin right now. I am just working through another braid that I gotten from Bren over at Snurb Yarn and Fiber. Um, and so when that's further along, I'll definitely be sharing it with you and definitely follow up on Instagram because I will probably post progress photos there as I get further along into the spinning process. Anyway, okay, so I'm pulling up some questions on my phone and I'm going to start here on Instagram. Um, since it's the easiest place for me to start, and again, it's the place where I post the most. How many times have I mentioned Instagram in this video? Leave it in the comments. <laughs> um, okay, so here we are. Okay, there's a few questions here. So Rebecca from Chemnitz, her username is Chemnitz, has asked, what is my opinion on reskeining yarn? Um, that's a good question. There are pretty much two lines of thought here. Um, pe some people really love to see yarn reskeined, and some people do not love yarn reskeined. And me, I'm the group that I do not like reskeining yarn for a couple of reasons, or I don't like to see yarn reskeined for a couple of reasons, so I'll go at it from both ends. So as a fiber artist, somebody who works with yarn, I don't like to see yarn reskeined for the reason that I like to be able to read the yarn. So I like to see how it was dyed in the pot, unless it's a, a colorway that has to be reskeined, so something that's like a gradient or a self-striping yarn where the skeins are normally like 6, 12, 20 meters long. Um, then I would like like it reskeined, but I would like to know that it is self-striping or a gradient. Gradients are easy to tell, but sometimes yarns that are dyed in a more um, regular fashion. So these are speckled. So the color repeats are random. They're not meant to pull. They're not meant to um, have any sort of patterning. It should speckle up evenly, but it's not a regular color color repeat. So so that's how I dye most of my yarn. And so I don't reskein it for the simple fact that I don't feel like it needs to be reskeined. But anyway, so anyway, um don't don't get ahead of yourself. Okay, so here we go. So this is speckled. 
it has short color repeats, I can see it in the skein, and this is how I dyed it. So when it was laid in the pan, it was laid out, the dye was applied to it, I skeined it up. Now, the problem, the problem I see with re-skeining comes more with yarns like this. So I did a custom order of Never Say Die on DK. So here's one of the skeins of Never Say Die. And it has regular color repeats. So it goes red and then yellow and then green and then blue. And it should do that for the entirety of the skein. It is how it was dyed. It is intended to pool. Um, and I put that in the color name. Now, if I were purchasing yarn and I saw a yarn that was skeined up in this manner. So this takes a, a moment. To, it even still has the dye tie on it. That's that's how little processing I've done to this. Um, so if I see a yarn that comes up like this and I unfold the skein, I can easily read the skein and see like, oh, these are regular color repeats and then plan out which projects I want to do in my head. Like, or if I have a project in mind that uses a pooling yarn or I'm gonna do planned pooling with crochet, then I would look at this and I could be able to tell that. What the difficulty comes and the reason why I don't like to see yarns reskein unless they say exactly what kind of colorway it is. So yarns like this can resemble self-striping yarns when they are reskeined because the color repeats are so regular that it's going to look like self-striping yarn. Even though this is not self-striping, it is repeating, but it it is not technically a self-striping yarn where you're going to have blocks of color striping. You might have micro stripes or pooling, but it's, you know, I, I like to be able to read the skein and say like, oh, this is speckled. This is going to knit up or crochet up in a certain way. And it's more with crochet than I have an issue because in crochet, I do not like to use yarns that pool and I don't like using yarns with regular color repeats unless they're a gradient or self-striping color, but preferably a gradient or speckled. Like I prefer gradients and speckles with crochet. And so as a consumer, I don't like seeing yarns reskeined because I can see the colors in the skein. I don't need to see them blended together. Uh, and then there's nothing wrong with liking them reskeined either. Um, as a business owner, as somebody who dyes yarn as a business and I do it all the time and I'm constantly processing yarn. I have yarn that's not labeled, I have yarn that's put away, I have yarn that's hanging up, I have yarn that's drying. One more step in the process is too much. So to sit and re-skein every single skein of yarn that I dye is, it, it's astronomical how much time that would take. If there's a problem with my skein, so if I'm snapping it out and I notice that there's a strand that's been pulled out or there's a tangle or a knot or something that I cannot resolve myself by hand before I skein it up and label it and sell it, uh, then I will re-skein the yarn because it's needed. I'd rather have the headache of detangling something than passing that on to someone else. And so I'm very meticulous when it comes to that. Some colorways that I do reskein are self-striping colorways because it is not feasible for most people to reskein a six meter or longer skein. Um, gradients as well, so most gradients are dyed on a blank format where it's a pre-knit piece of fabric, and so I do reskein those now um, instead of selling them in the blank form because most people don't know how to use that form, at least my customer base, I find that it leads to more confusion. And so I'll reskein those. I'll reskein mini skeins. So when I'm breaking up a 100 gram skein into five 20 gram mini skeins or three 33 gram mini skeins or whatever size I, I choose, I have to reskein those and wind them into smaller skeins. And I do prefer doing that myself because I don't like dying on small 20 gram skeins that are pre-made personal preference. So that's where I stand in the reskeining camp. I'm in the no reskein camp, but I do do it for, you know, for technical purposes where if there's a, yar a yarn, <laughs> if there's a knot or something in my yarn. So anyway, I digress. I will not go into that further. I guess if you, do you have an opinion? Do you like seeing uh, yarn reskeined? Do you not like it reskeined? I'll put a poll in the I card. Are you in the reskein camp or the no reskein camp? Let me know up here in the I card. 
Um, what is your dyeing process? I'm brand new to dyeing and fascinated by all different techniques. This is by lovetink81 on Instagram. So, I love Tink81 on Instagram. Um, I actually recently just did a, a video about uh, my dye process. So, if you've not seen it, definitely check out the video. I will have it linked down below and also in the iCard. But um, it goes pretty much from A to Z a general dye day, what things look like, the materials that I use, the pans that I use, the dyes that I use, all of that. It's just a general overview of how I do my dye process. So Caberly7 on Instagram says, how is your relationship with Etsy? Are they easy to work with or not? So um, my, my shop is housed on Etsy. So that's where my storefront is digitally. All of my products can be found on Etsy at the time that I'm filming this. And so I'll again put up my information here. I do have a standalone website. It's littlebeanlovesyarn.com. The shop now button does redirect to Etsy. There, hmm, how do you answer this? Uh, it's a love-hate relationship with Etsy. Etsy's great in terms of exposure. So you are more likely to be found on Etsy by someone just browsing and searching for a product. So if somebody types in hand-dyed yarn, you're going to see about 25,000 listings or more, depending on your search terms. Um, but if someone were to type in Harry Potter yarn or, you know, gradient yarn or speckled gradient, you might find fewer choices and you're more likely to find my yarn by an organic search. Um, that's why I like leaving my shop on Etsy because if I'm having to take a step back from social media, there's always a chance that someone will be finding my shop on Etsy or through Instagram and they would like find me more organically that way than having my own standalone site where if someone just Googles hand dyed yarn, you might not be able to find me particularly. Um, yeah, so so that's the, the good thing about Etsy is that it's geared toward crafters and handmakers. Bad part is that it is just, it's just so many people and so many shops and so much variety and choice that it's almost too much. So I do have a standalone site and eventually I would like to move my shop mostly off of Etsy and onto my own standalone site. If you like that or not like that, let me know in the comments. I don't know unless I ask so. Um, if you are a customer of mine or if you like browsing my yarn or are interested in purchasing my yarn, would you rather purchase through a site like Etsy or would you rather purchase off of a standalone site? Um, I've never pulled you guys for that, but please let me know in the comments. I don't enjoy the fees that come with Etsy. Um, it's a bit higher than it would be if I had a standalone site, but again, th the trade-off is the marketing aspect where Etsy does do promotions on you know, sale listings or other things like that. I don't necessarily agree with a lot of the things that Etsy chooses to promote only because, not that it devalues, but it's like, oh, put your stuff on sale because we're going to be promoting anybody who has a sale for Memorial Day weekend. It's like not every handmaker can afford to put their things on sale, you know, seven or eight times a year. I do run sales and things like that, but I can never take advantage of those uh, marketing things through Etsy, so it's a little frustrating. Um, customer service wise, I've never had a problem with them. Uh, resolving issues, I've never had a problem with them. Technically, their website is okay. It has problems just like any other website would have, but it, it kind of makes it easier because I am tech savvy, but I am not a website developer. So if I were to have problems on my own website, I might not necessarily know how to fix them. And for me, it's easy just to email Etsy and be like, hey, can you fix this problem? I'm having a bug in, in your website. So anyway, that's my opinion about Etsy. Um, knit to Pearl Jam. Uh, what was your biggest flop and what steps failed for you in the beginning? Not trying to steer you in a negative direction, but you seem to do things so effortlessly. I'm always intrigued to learn from others' mistakes. I'm dabbling and dying just for my own personal stash. So my biggest flop and what steps failed? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> I've had many flops. Um... I know it seems like everything just kind of falls into place and is perfect or whatever, 
because of it's almost like a limited, you guys have a limited lens into my life, literally, uh, through this camera and through my photos and videos on Instagram. And so, and Facebook as well, or my interactions with you guys on other social platforms like Facebook groups or whatever. And so I know things seem like, oh, everything's great or everything's easy or she must sell so much yarn. And um, my biggest f flops, I mean, are colorways that fail. So Anytime you're designing something new, a new design in in the yarn, whether it's like, oh, I want to try a new technique like glazing, or I want to try self-striping, or I want to try a gradient, or I want to try putting these colors together, I have an idea for a palette. Um, not everything works great, and not everything gets executed well. And so what I, I try to take those types of failures and I try to create something new from them. So if <laughs> you've seen in some of my photos, like I have a little, a little Bob Ross pop figure and I really, I love Bob Ross. I grew up watching him, but in terms of like his mantra when it comes to doing art and doing something creative is that there are no mistakes. It's just happy accidents. And so I kind of see my failures as happy accidents. How can I turn it to be something better? So when I'm looking at this colorway, this colorway was a happy accident. It was a mistake. It was something that wasn't intended to be created, but ended up being created and something that turns out to be beautiful. Um, so that's really kind of where I feel like my biggest failures end up being is, well, I'll fail at a colorway or something won't look right and I'll just throw it aside and be like, I'm just going to over dye it later. Um, what else has been a failure? Probably, you know, I get into my own way when it comes to things. So I really hold myself to an unreasonable standard and it's, it takes me, it's taken me, you know, 30 something years to really start buckling down and, and telling myself like, Kayleen, you can't keep holding yourself to unreasonable perfection standards when you're a human and you do human things and you have human emotions. You're not a robot. You're not like, you can't do everything perfectly the first time. So don't be hard on yourself when something doesn't go perfectly the first time or something doesn't feel like it's right and so that's kind of like things that I end up failing at is in my mind I am just I'm always a trying to achieve this goal that I will never ever reach and so um I really try to turn that back around and you know just compare myself to myself and you know, say like, oh, well, you've come so far in this, or you're doing so well in this. And like, don't put pressure on yourself to just figure it out or that you can do it or can't do it. Um, in terms of things like being effortless or feeling like they're effortless, I really, 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 really try to live by that I am my own stopping block. Like the only thing that's stopping me from learning a new skill or doing something new is myself. And so once I open myself up to something, like for example, flatbed knitting, I got a flatbed knitter. If you saw my last podcast, you know all about it. The LK150, I, I, I can't see it. It's over on the desk over there. And so when I get into something, I go in like two feet first, trying to get it, done, get it done right, learn a new skill. But like, I work really hard at it. And I, I spent a lot of time learning it and a lot of time doing it, a lot of time studying about it and watching videos and reading. So it's the same thing when I got into dying. It, it's like I, it seems so effortless, but so much work and effort goes behind the scenes that you're not seeing that it's like, that's why it seems effortless. Um, the skills that I've gained for dying have come through a lot of practice and just a lot of pushing through not so great colorways or not so great techniques or bases that I didn't quite like or, um, you know, I once, okay, so another fail. So <laughs> I, when I was creating the elder tree colorway, and if I have a picture, I'll put it up, but it's a really layered colorway. And the first fall that I was dying, which is the fall of 2016, I decided to do a tree series. Whomping Willow, Elder Tree, and Wigan Tree. 
and those three colors are some of the most complicated colors I have ever made. They're all made using glazing and dipping and speckling and pretty much every technique that you can do as a dyer, are, except like self-striping and gradient, like which are really specialty. They're all wrapped up into each of those colorways, so I very rarely dye them anymore because they just take so much time and effort. And so when I was designing Elder Tree, because it goes through so many processes, and I was learning how much citric acid to put in and you know how I was going to manage the temperature and all of these things, I came out the other side with these super crunchy skeins and and I was just like, they're sticky. I don't know what the problem is. Like, what did I do wrong? I went asking on forums on Facebook and I'm like, hey, <laughs> can anybody help me? I think I destroyed this yarn. And so I've seen so many posts like that since then from other dyers or other people who are learning. And, you know, I I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh man, what did I do? What did I do? And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to give it another bath. I'm going to rinse out as much as I can. Maybe it's residue. Maybe I didn't destroy it. Maybe I didn't overcook it. And it turned out it was just a, a surplus of citric acid so it was able to be fixed and it worked out fine but anyway so that's like another fail but I turned it into a learning experience and like okay well now I know how much citric acid I actually need for this process or if I'm going to be doing multiple step processes how much I need to put into each step so you know it's not effortless it doesn't just come and I'm just like boom I'm gonna die this boom I'm gonna die that you know it just it comes with all of this learning experience so that's that's pretty much that. Okay, so I'm looking at my post on Facebook. So I only posted this like an hour ago, so I'm not expecting to have a ton of questions. Um, but Amanda on Facebook says, No question here, but I thoroughly loved knitting the one speckled gradient yarn I got from you. I'm wearing the socks today, and I love, love, love your yarn. I'm going to knit the others too. I hoard them, and I like petting them while they wait to grow up into something. <laughs> um, I think everybody here can... Um, agree with that sentiment that, <laughs> you know, taking and buying a yarn and just having it, you know, my little precious is just one of the most wonderful things. All right, so I'm going to wrap up this video here. Um, thank you so much for your questions, your comments. Definitely share with me below. I always try and answer as many comments as I can. At least right now, I'm able to read through every single one and try and reply to every single one. I can't promise that it will always be like that, but uh, for the most part, I am always looking and checking back um, to see if people have commented. So um, if you do have any questions for me, definitely leave them in the comment section down below and maybe I'll do another Ask Me Anything and I'll pull from your questions. Um, as always, I hope you really enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more like this. And also when you subscribe, make sure you hit that bell icon because uh, YouTube does not like to send uh, live feeds or you know new uploads to everybody's um, subscription boxes. So if you really do want to be notified, make sure you hit the notification bell so that you can see every time I upload a new video and every time I go live on my YouTube channel. So I hope you have a great week. Enjoy it. Um, enjoy the nice warm weather. Hopefully that will be coming your way and my way. Uh, and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!